Joining us today, General Manager of your LA Kings, Rob Blake. How are you doing today, Rob? Good. How are you guys? Excellent. And featuring Zach Dooley. How are you doing today, Zach? Jesse, I'm doing great. Look at this elaborate setup we have here for all the Kings men. First time we've rolled this out. I think it looks pretty good. So, Rob, first question. Uh, Vladislav Gavrikov wore number four in Columbus. If he agreed to knock a million dollars off of his contract, would you let him wear number four? Here? Yeah, you didn't even have to finish the question. I would have answered that. <laughs> Easily take that. <laughs> Luke told us that we asked the same question about Phil when he signed here, and he said if he took two million off the deal, he would take 99 down and let him wear that. Okay, so, now we're getting that's yeah. a little <laughs> uncharted territory, but you never know. That's how you manage the cap. Another question, and this one tore our office apart this summer. Um, with the benefit of air traffic control, but without autopilot, could you land a 747 in an emergency? Who's With the aid of air traffic yeah. control on the mic. Mm -hmm. But no autopilot. But no autopilot. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know if I would have that capability if I had to try for sure. But sure. Uh, Well, you got to try. Yeah. yeah. I've watched a few movies on it maybe. You never know. <laughs> so this summer started off uh, with a relative whirlwind of activity. There were a number of moves made early and then sort of a, a lull. How much activity was going on? Like, were you working on Pierre-Luc Dubois when the Peterson trade happened, when the Jersey trade happened? Yeah, no, no. More, more of that was cap compliant, uh, trying to fit uh, a, a roster that we thought we could get cap compliant throughout the summer. Uh, to shed some money to uh, all that was in preparation to uh, re-sign Gavrikov, the first step. And then, uh, you know, probably within a few weeks after that, we were getting closer to the draft. I think that was, so that was June to July there, um, was all the news with uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois. And then, uh, you know, getting in on that, uh, that type of deal and then figuring out how we were going to structure that cap-wise. It's fair to say then that that deal from everything you've said is kind of, come out of nowhere right like you didn't maybe expect that player to be yeah. available but how important was having the space that you did create with those deals so that way when it did come available you guys were ready to pounce well we knew we had to move other cap to go with it um you just don't uh, i guess you don't see a lot of centermen at that young age uh, you know we've done our little research uh, prior to that and you don't see a lot of them uh, change teams at that age so uh you know, to say that we were sitting there planning on something like not not really. We understood our center position and the need with uh, Kopitar uh, and understanding his structure of his contract and what he was left uh, playing with that that there may be a hole there we need to fill. And then, uh, you know, this came along with it that fit the criteria age wise and, and talent skill wise. When I was a kid, I always heard the term a five year plan. And it took me until I was a lot older to realize that a five year plan doesn't mean in 2005, you know where you're going to be in 2010. It means every year you're readjusting your five-year plan. When you have the opportunity to acquire a player like Kevin Fiala, that has to change the five-year plan pretty significantly. Then when you have the opportunity to acquire a player like Pierre-Luc Dubois, that again has to change that five-year plan. So how far away and how much adjustment was required? And do you have some sort of core principles that you stick with while those plans have to yeah, change. I don't know if it, it it's per se change plans. It, um, you know, there's a stage where you're acquiring talent, so you're acquiring draft picks, you're acquiring young players, and that. Uh, but knowing that they're not all going to play for your team, you're going to have to start filling different holes. Um, you know, when you sit back at the end of the year and understand your roster better, and say, okay, this can come in. Now, what we did with Fiala, with Dubois, with Dano, um, uh, Arvidsson in this case, are, are, are players that are immediately playing in the NHL. Not so much that you're you're getting them saying, okay, two or three years of development, they're going to be able to fill this role. You know what they're doing. They have enough games under their belt. You know where they fit into your roster. Uh, you know, with Fiala, the lack of uh, natural high-end offense on the on the wings was an important uh, box to fill. Now, we could have done that through the draft and, and obviously drafted kids to project it to fit that, but the timeline on that takes a while. So these are immediate impacts that get you to a different standard. I feel like the easy part is almost identifying these kinds of players, but then fitting them in within the constraints of the league, the basically yeah. flat cap over the years. How much of a raise did Jake Goldberg earn in this summer? And yeah. How much work has he had to put in yeah. to manage the salary cap? Well, constantly, because there, there is always speculation, is it going to go up more than a million on the cap? And, and, and now we kind of know the projection the next two years will be bigger jumps. Uh, uh, not a lot. To, you know, we, we'd always work off about 2 or 2.5% prior to the pandemic, and then that has slowed down. 
Uh, so there's some juggling there, but you see a lot of uh, cap maneuvering on uh, different contracts going in and out. Uh, when contracts are up, uh, you know, we like to kind of look at the, the difference of when you're paying guys it, it, it is in their prime years and, and certain years there. Um, but then you also have to be able to fit that in, uh, knowing that somebody may come. We're not sure who it'll be in a year or two to, to fill a, a specific need. I think what we've been able to do is, is shrink the needs. And now when you look at the team, there are specific needs when you go forward and when you finish the season and review it, then you go and target those type of players. I don't want to get too deep into the weeds on today's roster because by the time people hear this, I imagine it'll change. Yeah. <laughs> um, but since Zach brought up Jake, uh, the media talked to Todd on Monday, and Todd revealed that he has been meeting with you and with Jake um, at least this week. It felt like he was saying every day, if not twice a day. Um, how much input does a coach normally have on the construction of a roster near the end of training camp, and how much – has that input changed as a result of the cap situation this year? Well, I, I just think the number of players available to the coach. Um, so, you know, in prior years, we probably carried 22, 23 players, you know, sometimes at the max, depending. We knew once we got through July this year that we'd be uh, hard pressed to be able to get 22 players in the roster. So we were going to be carrying one extra. So then the question goes to Todd and the coaching staff, do you want that on the back end? you want it for defense or do you want it to a forward? And uh, the original plan was probably seven defensemen because – um, if you do have an injury, you still have to get to 18 skaters minus that to be in an emergency situation. So, so that player, that, that extra player has to play. If it's a forward, he's not going to play D. Uh, you can dress seven and you can go 11. So uh, unfortunately, we got in the situation because of suspension, not injury. I didn't, we didn't anticipate a suspension that early in the season, obviously. Um, but, but it's a relatively the same. There's no cap relief. That's your extra player that now is out of the roster. Um, so, so Todd's idea was let's try uh, the, the game against Vegas. Let's, let's try 11 and 7. It's not ideal because the, uh, the forward coming out uh, uh, was a top nine forward. A lot of times when you see teams do 11 and 7, they, they pick the forward they want out. So then they can kind of move guys around. He didn't really like the flow or the feel of it. So he came in the next day. He said, what can we do to get to 12 forwards? So now we have to set our roster, uh, be cap compliant, uh, first of all. And then it's like, okay, so opening day, if he wants 12 forwards, then we got to be at only 6D because Arthur Callie is our extra player right there. Uh, then we got to look at who's eligible to be able to go up and down if you don't want to put anybody on waivers. So that that's the situation. A lot of times we meet with Todd and say, okay, what do you want with your lineup? He, you know, he would like 12 forwards uh, to start uh, this season. And I said, well, to accomplish this, this is what we have to do, but this player has to go down. And th those are the conversations we have with Todd. And then they can change in a day just because of an injury somewhere else. How difficult are the conversations that have to happen with a player in that situation because you have a Laferrier who probably earned his spot but had to go down then he came back up now you have a Jordan Spence who's down I'm sure that he's earned his spot too he has to come back up how do you have those conversations knowing it's maybe not permanent but maybe more day-to-day -day? yeah and it's hard to project so you say okay well you're only going down for two games but we, we don't know what's going to happen over those two games so basically we said okay listen we're going to run our roster we're going to go 12 and 7 you would have been in that 12 and 7 this is Jordan's conversation yesterday unfortunately with with a, a suspension uh we're going to run with 12 forwards we have to bring someone in you're eligible because of waivers uh, or not having to go on waivers to go down the plan would be to go down for a couple games, get through that suspension. If we're healthy, we'll go back to our original plan. So you lay it out that way, but again, things change all the time. And uh, unfortunately, that, that's the situation they're caught in. This is another question that Todd was asked. Um, it'll be different, I imagine, from front office standpoint than from a coaching staff. But how much of a benefit is it knowing at least the core of the roster, the bulk of the roster is set, and then you can work around the margins? Well, I think this year in particular, knowing that we had to go to Australia early, we're only going to be able to carry, uh, I think it was 26, 27 players. Um, we knew that the, the team would be intact in pretty much from day one. There would be three or four extras in each position that you would probably see during the year just because of natural injuries or, or change in the roster. So uh, Todd had that to work with right from day one, which you don't usually get in in training camp. So we had the first uh, week in Australia, came home, they had five or six days off, and then there's three remaining games, but it's been the same group the whole time. So we interchanged maybe two or three players. It, it, much more set this year than any other season. Todd seemed to like that. 
Yeah. He did. All coaches do. Yeah. They, they, You get into camp with 60 guys, they want to get their roster right away. So it's like this way he had his choice there. I, I think because of familiar with drills, uh, the players get up to speed quicker. And, and he can work on a special teams with guys that are going to be in the special teams. But when you have 60 players and you're doing power play, your guys are kind of split around or, or any kind of special team. So uh, coaches would prefer that every time. Management also wants to give kids a, a good look. You entered last season with, I think, over $10 million allocated to goalies, at least as yeah. far as cap hits. Yeah. This season, it's significantly less, but you have Fiala and Dubois, which yeah. you didn't have two years ago, I guess. Um, I'm assuming that's a situational thing, and that I, I understand that Aiden Hill and, uh, and Darcy Kemper have sort of set a new standard for public perception of, of what kind of goalie you need to win a cup. But is that something that is on the at least the back burner to look yeah. forward to in the future? Yeah, and I think and then you had to look at what was available summer. Um, you know where you're going to uh, allocate your your cap space or the dollars that you had. We knew we'd be in for a tough year this year, just the way things were structured. Uh, what was coming off the books or potentially coming off and what we were trying to add. You know, we're, we're going to have steps here where some of our younger players are coming out of entry levels and there's big discrepancies on what they could get after that. So we're trying to project that. But we felt we had cap flexibility over the next couple years if we need a specific target to get to. Now Dubois comes into play. We want to get that young center at that ripe age and everything. You do what you do to put it in and then you have to, uh, you know, look at all other positions probably by the year end and say, okay, we're where can we uh, where can we put some funds to to help the team improve? So do you look at Quinton Byfield and say like we want you to have a good year, but not so good of a year <laughs> yeah. that we have yeah. a problem next year? Yeah, no, and those are the guys, you know. Yeah, obviously Quinton and Arthur Kaliev and uh, Spence and Clark. Eventually, these guys uh, Laferriere will be coming out of entry levels, and if if they do hit certain benchmarks, you can kind of see where the contract structures, whether it's a, a bridge deal or they go to to the bigger deals on on the term. And those are things we're going to have to. Those are good problems though, because that means they're hitting uh, the milestones you'd like them to. I will get into the weeds on one player because I've just been so impressed by him. Um, Alex Laferriere. Yeah. Did you have any sense uh, when he was being scouted, when you drafted him, even when he was playing at Harvard under you know, King's control, that he might come in and command that much attention? Uh, probably not. Uh, I, I think the reports, uh, if I went back a full year, so we'll sit in the summer and we'll say, okay, what are our priorities on our uh, – our, our prospects right now, which ones are aging out of junior, which ones are getting close to being, uh, you know, either a junior or senior in college because they have the option of becoming free agents. Which ones do we want to get more pressure on or more views this during the season so we can make the uh, the decision to, to have them turn pro? And, and Laferrier was always at the top, okay? He's at, at Harvard. Uh, traditionally, these guys like to finish their four-year career. There's a lot of options for him. He had gone to a school a year early where they didn't play during the pandemic, took classes, so there's a little different different situation but he was a priority because they felt he was very close to being able to be pro it could have been last year but elected to go back to school so as that season went on the more conversations with the agent the family uh, just letting them know that our our observations are he's ready to turn pro if he wants to be an NHL player come in he got the head start at the end of the last year played some games or stayed on our roster for a little bit then played games in the American League um, and it didn't take a, it wasn't a big adjustment. So then we come back the summer and say, well, he's going to help us sometime during this season. But he's come in and he's had a real good camp. Um, he got the benefit of the doubt during that uh, suspension to Arthur, the first game of the preseason when we were in Salt Lake to, to play alongside Dubois and Fiala. And he fit with a lot of different characteristics. Um, you know, saw some real good things with him. So then when Todd wanted to get the 12-man roster, he was the next guy up. But he's had a good camp. Our development guys have been very high on him. And, and uh, uh, just on the time frame that they think he was a, a lot closer than the other kids to making the NHL. If you look at the way that camp shook out, the 28 players, 28-7 that went to Australia – created opportunity for a guy like LaFerrier to play more games here than yeah. he might have otherwise. You imagined one guy, two guys might take advantage of that. Was he almost the beneficiary of not being in that group because he could excel, play, you know, yep. RW1 and these other games here? Yeah, so we had the, the the basically the one game when we were gone here, but then we came home, we had three that we weren't playing any of the guys that went to, or, or sprinkling one or two in at the end of that. Um, <clears throat> what we, we started to notice was these kids that were playing – would be getting spots that they could excel in, whether it's power play, whether it's penalty kill, or whether it's regular minutes in the middle. 
Whereas you had five veterans in there and they might not get it. So we, we go to overtime against Anaheim and we have guys on the, uh, you know, the four on three or whatever in overtime. They're probably not out there if you have five veterans, right? So, so that, kind of made us look at the camp and say well should we structure some of our similar camps going forward like this where you play kids for the first three or four games of training camp in in spots where they can actually perform uh what they're used to doing so we did see that this year was was a little bit different would he be a beneficiary yeah he was in those games and he actually produced in those games this summer i fell prey to believing what I heard on social media. So I heard that Gavrikov wouldn't, you know, was going to go to free agency. He does it. Pierre-Luc Dubois was going to sign in Montreal. He didn't. Um, you're a former player. Luke Robitaille is a former player. Nelson Emerson's a former player. Did your personal experiences as players inform you that what you hear in the media isn't always true? Well, not not so much. I mean, in the case of Gavrikov, the, the day we traded for him, we're, we're having conversations with his agent. Now we can talk to his agent. We don't, we have him. He's in our – we knew exactly kind of where he was coming in at, what type of term he wanted, whether it was long or short. Uh, it was a matter of trying to fit it in. But there was no rush going into the playoffs. And we even said that. We said, listen, we're just going to play this. We like the fit and everything. Let's get back as soon as the season's over. So the minute the season's over, we're having conversation. We know the range he's in, but we got to create cap space. So – uh, a lot of stuff you would read in the paper, but, but behind the scenes, we had had conversations with the agent to understand that fully. Uh, Dubois situation is a little different because uh, you, you don't actually have the permission to talk off the hop, right? Until you, until you ask for that throughout the, uh, the transactions with Winnipeg. So uh, yeah, you, a lot of that is speculation. You're kind of like, okay, is there other teams involved? How many, how many players or how many uh, pieces can teams give to fit this in and that? So th they were different situations, but I would say in the Gavrikov case, uh, we were real comfortable understanding the term and the in the range that he was going to come at uh, prior to the end of the season. How quickly did it take with Dubois to overturn an incorrect public perception? Because it felt like for us, the first time we spoke with him, you talked to this good person who has yeah. these heartwarming things. Yeah. And none yeah. of that is the narrative that was yeah. kind of coming in with him. Yeah, and, and, and again, that's a lot of perception and different things. Uh, we have to do our homework and understand the character of the of the player and, uh, and and what he was looking for in his his future going forward. And that, uh, you know, specifically for us was the the, the size and the middle position and uh, giving us some depth through our lineup that we feel we lack last year. When you have a pair like Gavrikov and Roy. Gavrikov comes in and pairs with Matt Roy in a way that seems to elevate both of them exponentially. Yeah. Is that enough to alter what may have been part of another five-year plan looking forward? Like, are you discovering things that maybe you didn't know would be there and then adjusting on the fly? Yeah, I think when we looked at our roster last year, we had a number of right-handed D. Uh, we lacked a little size on the left, and we lacked the the shutdown ability on the left. So as the trade deadline uh, approach, you start narrowing down uh, potential players that were available. Uh, a lot of things change during the season. A lot of teams make other players available. And, and then getting the right fit. The one thing we knew with Matt Roy, we, we had the – I'll go a year before that when we had a lot of injuries on the back end. Whoever we had young coming up and we put with Matt Roy – uh, usually had a good statistical game at the end of the game. Um, you know, he was able to play with a lot of different players. So we knew he could carry it a, a partner and have a shutdown, but we needed that the right specific on the left side. And uh, the other thing with Gavrikov is his stick's real good in the neutral zone. The way we line a 1-3-1, one, one, our lefties up a lot. He, he reads those plays real well and is able to break a lot of plays up. I wasn't going to ask this, but since you mentioned it, yeah. the one three one with the left D and the right D, I have noticed, and I've been assured by some people that it's coincidence, but I've been assured by other people that it's by design. The left D tends to be a Mikey Anderson Gavrikov type, and the right yep. D tends to be a Jordan Spence, Sean yep. Dersey. Okay. Yeah, and and part of that. So Todd's been with us now, uh, going on six years, and and uh, we, uh, you know he wasn't a, a big one three one uh, coach prior to coming here. He wanted to change some things within our system and our, our structure here. But the one three one allows the right D to go back and get pucks. So uh, primarily somebody that can get back, get his head up, make that first pass real quick. Um, you know, some of the draft picks coming into there, the way it fell, that, that, that was what the characteristics were, that right side. Um, when you go get <clears throat> a, a Gavrikov, that's a more specifically – altered you know the draft is you, you, you know you're hoping that an 18 year old in four or five years has a character so just to play in the NHL but Gavrikov knowing the one three one knowing how he played uh, was more of a, a specific fit for that 
Anything else? I think I'm good. All right. Rob All right. Blake, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you, guys.